This is the Beats Working Show. We're on a mission to redeem work, the word, the place, and the way. I'm your host, Mark Wright. Join us because getting paid to practice beats working to get paid. So your attacker, Mark Stroman, was arrested and convicted of the two murders of the people that he killed and convicted of the attempted murder of you. There was a turning point that caused you to forgive Mark Stroman for what he did to you. When did that turning point happen and what led you to that race? Well, forgiveness took place in two folds. First, after this incident happened to me, I did not think about the shooting incident. I did not think about my attacker. I kept my focus on getting my life on track, getting medical treatment, get back to a normal life, go back to school, rebuild my life in the very country where it was shattered. So that helped me a lot to move forward without being, remain sad, depressed, angry, and also you know, be consumed with negativity because of what has done to me. And this is one of the process of finding forgiveness that you need to take time to you know, understand what happened to you Instead of focusing on the crime, focus on yourself. That will help you divert your focus, focus on good things, on positive things. And in course of time, I reflected on the lessons I learned from my parents and from my faith, my Islamic faith. And uh, that inspired me to forgive my attacker. But the forgiveness was not for my attacker. It was for myself to move forward so that I do not stay sad, angry, depressed, full of paths of revenge and retaliation, those are negative energy to cause a lot of stress and trauma, you know, in you personally. So I was able to forgive in order to move on, to find myself, to rebuild my life. It helped a lot. But then in course of time, when I went to Mecca in 2009 to perform pilgrimage with my mother, I did not realize, I, I, until I felt that forgiveness was not enough. Yes, I forgive my attacker. I felt good, but what is the true benefit and outcome for me, for my attacker, and also what kind of common good it brings to the society? I deeply thought about my attacker sitting on death row waiting to die, and I realized that by killing him, we would lose, we would simply lose another human being without dealing with the root cause. I began to see him as a human being like me, not just a killer. I also saw him as a victim of the victim of family, dysfunctional family, a victim of our broken education system, a victim of broken justice system, prison system. I saw him a broken man who never had the chance to repair himself, who never had the chance to rehabilitate himself, or who never ever had the love, kindness, empathy, respect that every human being deserved in their life. He grew up as a broken child. He grew up as a broken human being. So I fell for him and I realized that, no, I need to do more because I had a promise to God that if he gave me a chance to live, I would do good others. What have I done for others? I have done very well in my own life. I moved on from working in restaurants, going back to school, into IT, traveling the world. I did very well. What have I done to keep my promise? So I thought about that. Maybe I need to do something for my attacker, at least trying to save his life. So I came back from Mecca with a renewed vision. With the heart, I felt extremely soft, full of kind, compassion, and mercy, and forgiveness. And I realized that I need to do something for my attacker. And that inspired me to launch a global campaign to try and save his life from Texas death. Did you get any pushback race? I mean, did people say, what are you doing? You're crazy to try to save this guy's life. Well, to be honest with you, I did, but very, very, you know, a little amount because some people send me email. They're saying, oh, Muslims are not supposed to forgive. And you're supposed to kill and convert the non-Muslims. All kinds of stereotypes we hear in the news media. So they try to, they send those kind of, you know, wrong message to me saying that what I was doing was wrong because that my faith does you know, doesn't dictate that or promote that. So it was an opportunity for me 
to educate those people. So I did not ignore those emails. Rather, I responded each and every email, you know, giving them facts and examples, and I never heard back from them. Some people told me that, oh, what I was trying to do is going to inspire a lot of people like Mark Stroman to do the same kind of, you know, mistake. And my message was very simple that what me and people who came forward to help our campaign was trying to send a new narrative, set a new narrative that we don't have to kill people for their mistakes. We don't have to, you know, focus on punishment. We don't have to focus on only on punishing people, but not giving a chance to repair and rehabilitate. We were not asking to let him go free. We were actually asking to lower his punishment so that he finally get a chance to repair and rehabilitate. And he could inspire people like him in the free world who were willing and ready to hurt and hate people. And who could talk more powerfully than the person who committed the crime? So that was our hope. And uh, the people who you know, criticized in the very beginning, it was an opportunity for us to, to correct their views and thoughts. And also it was an opportunity to share what is correct information and also to make them understand it is for common good. It is not for promoting crime or inspiring people like Mark Stroman to do more crimes. So this is a 10-year process that Mark Stroman's on death row in Texas. And over that time, he becomes aware that you are fighting for his life. And he starts to transform as a human being. And I want to fast forward to the day that he was executed. The lawyers, his lawyers and your lawyers, were able to make it so that you could speak to each other on the phone. The state of Texas had prevented you from talking with Mark Stroman, I guess, before that. What did Mark tell you, Race, that day that he was executed? Every time I talk about this phone conversation, you know, I get goosebumps because what can you tell to a human being who is about to be executed? There is not much you really can talk. And knowing that I was about to go to the court to fight one last time to save his life. The pressure was tremendous on my shoulder, not knowing which way, you know, would go things to that. And at that time, knowing that my attacker, Mark Stroman, was sitting next to the execution chamber, waiting for this court hearing to be over, it's a tremendous pressure. You know, it's like a life and death situation. And I, I was very emotional because at that moment, I was thinking about my life and death situation on my way to the hospital, not knowing if I was about, if I were going to make it. I couldn't say goodbye to my parents. I couldn't say goodbye to anyone. And I never realized that I would lose my life in America, where I came to achieve big dreams, big goals, and now I'm dying. So I, I could relate to that experience. And when I was told by the prison system that when I called and they told me that, oh, you are so-and-so, you cannot talk to him. And I realized, oh, now you're taking revenge because I filed a lawsuit against the prison system, the governor of Texas, the attorney general, to exercise my victim's right to have a mediation dialogue with my attacker before he was executed. And now because of that, you are you know, depriving me from exercising my right. One thing I learned in my life very well, that I don't take no for no. I always try to find around some workaround. So I called one of his friends who was managing his, uh, his activities on that day. And I was lucky enough that Mark was talking to him through a line phone, through a land phone. And that friend told me, if you want, I can put on a speaker. I can make it through your call. You can talk. Hmm. I said, let's do that. So when Mark came on the phone, I told him that, Mark, you know for sure that I forgave you. And I never hated you. And he said, Grace, I never expected this from you. I love you, bro. And when he said, I love you, bro, I couldn't hold my tears on. I was literally crying. This is the same human being 10 years ago. Shot me in the face for no reason other than hate. And this is the same human being 10 years later calling me his brother. And he said he loved me. That shows people can change, given the love, respect, kindness. And I believe he was genuine. When he called me brother, it was genuine. And he said, Ray, keep doing the world we've seen. 
And then he said, Reis, I have to go, they're calling me. And at the time I realized that maybe this is our last conversation. Maybe I'll never able to get the chance to talk to him anymore because they are taking him to the execution chamber because within an hour and a half, he will be executed. And this is the final phone call he had with me. I felt like that, that hearing from him these two words, that he loved me and he saw me, his brother, it helped me a lot in my journey of healing and finding closure. 